previous review of The Warhound and the World's Pain, I lamented that the book felt too short, that you're, and that there was a sexual assault sequence, or sequence isn't the correct word, but sexual assault coming up in the story that serves no narrative purpose and felt like it existed to pad the book. I should have noticed the finger curl on the monkey's paw before I started the second Von Beck novel, The City of Autumn Stars. The City of Autumn Stars moves the storyline up to Ulrich Von Beck's grandson, Manfred. Manfred fought in the American Revolution and had come to France to help the French Revolution, only to become disgusted with the September massacres and decided, fuck this, I'm going home. Except on the way home, Manfred gets roped into the family business. No, not soldiering. The other one. The one that smells of brimstone. Now, by all rights, this should work with me. I love swashbucklers, and I grew up watching the adaptations of the Scarlet Pimpernel stories starring Richard E. Grant. So, again, a more swashbuckly take on the Von Beck story um, should be my jam. But then the book puts its worst foot forward by opening not only on the September massacres, but also on the death of the Princess de Lambelle in particular. Moorcock elected to use the most lurid of the contemporary accounts of Lambelle's death, which would probably hit the buttons for almost every trigger morning short of those that involved harm to minors or animals. It is particularly egregious. There is evidence to suggest that this version is royalist propaganda or has been suggested that that is the case. But even in that situation, Moorcock is not a royalist by any stretch of the imagination. So having him pick that one is a deliberate choice. And that, of course, having it be the canonical version of what happened within the narrative of the Von Beck stories, that, that's a deliberate choice on his end. And then, as Manfred flees Paris, the book just slows down to a crawl. We get some swashbuckling interludes, but like Manfred doesn't even get to meet Lucifer until halfway through the book. And likewise, before getting into the Mitten March, the supernatural world that operates alongside ours. And then after that, Moorcock then falls back on one of his old habits old bad habits, self-plagiarism. Now, in the first Jerry Cornelius novel, The Final Program, Moorcock cribs heavily from The Dreaming City, in some cases lifting whole passage from the entire book, and he's owned up to this in the one of the collections of Jerry Cornelius novels. He has a bit at the end where he just puts two sections of The Final Program and The Dreaming City side by side. So he is aware of this and owns up to open full. This isn't a slander. Now, when, the, when he did this with the final program, it worked for me then, in part because the content and context was so different. Moorcock lifted the opening of The Dreaming City and, to a degree, some of the end of that story, but put all of those elements in the book's opening. So there, there's so much room from there to go in entirely different directions. It's using an earlier work as a foundation and building off of it in a different way. By contrast, The City of Autumn Stars takes The Siege of Tanlorn, a climactic moment from another Elric story, and plops that into the book's climax. It is taking a moment that is built to in an earlier story and building and then putting that as what's being built to here. Yes, the setting and characters are tweaked, but once I realized what was happening, as a person who enjoys Michael Moorcock's stories, my emotional response was, response was less joy at recognizing the reference and the desire to tell where the story is going and more frustration at Moorcock being arrogant to, at grabbing material from older works to pad page count and fill out an ending rather than coming up with something new. The arrogance at this case being Moorcock engaging in this particular variety of self-plagiarism and assuming that our response would be, or the response of the reader, I should say, would be, oh yes, you're doing you're doing the thing you did last time. I dig that, as opposed to frustration of this particular variety of reuse. 
This isn't the equivalent of John Woo having another gunfight in a church surrounded by doves, um, rehashing the climax of the killer or using elements of the killer climax in the climax of Face Off, for example. This isn't that. This would be the equivalent of, like, it's not taking the setting trappings. This feels felt, when I was reading it, more like if the if you had the climax of Face Off play off beat for beat for the climax of the killer, then at which point that stops feeling like the creator remixing his own material and more laziness, but going, oh, hey, I'm doing the thing you like, so excuse my laziness because you love me, right? That again, that's arrogance. That's being self-important. And that's kind of crappy. Between dragging its feet on the way to the metaphorical fireworks factory, the the getting into the meat of the story, and getting there and discovering it's a redress of an earlier fireworks factory, I feel like not moving forward with the rest of the Von Beck series. Like later installment is set in um Weimar Republic Germany and I feel like I feel like Moorcock is not going to handle this with the grace that the topic deserves or the setting I should say deserves so I'm not moving forward with the Von Beck series after this one now I'm certainly willing to revisit um, other Michael Moorcock stories and indeed I if you're reading the uh, the blog, I've recently reread Elric and Mel Nibony, uh for the Sword and Laser Book Club, and I'm planning on going through the rest of the series. But as far as the Von Beck series goes, this series wore out its welcome far too soon. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. I also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.